In this month of November, we're going to have some fun looking at how all of the elements of abstraction that we have studied so far, actually we've studied them all, we're gonna look at how they work together to create interesting abstract pieces, or maybe even pieces that are not so interesting. So let's have a look at a few examples here, and then I'm sure you'll have fun looking for examples of your own. The preface to this is that many of the images that I pulled from the internet did not have uh, any indication of who the actual creator was. And that could be because it was created in a studio uh, by a designer and therefore isn't considered art, which is kind of an interesting aspect of the creative design and art world that I usually refer to as being the commercial world where particular products are created under a label or through an atelier and individual artists don't get credit. So um, I think we're working from a slightly different perspective, but I wanted you to know why I can't attribute all of these pieces to a particular artist. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. But uh, we're kicking this off with a really, I love this, don't have any idea who made it, no real indication of how it was made either. Looks sort of like a digital collage in some ways to me, but in any event, it is combining irregular round shapes and complementary colors and value with some linear elements in what felt to my eye as a, a pretty dynamic um, composition. And one of the other reasons I included this is because I loved the fact that it could be mixed media or it could be a textile um, so that we can broaden how we think about this and what we're looking at to include the textiles that so many of us love and prefer. Here's John Beard. And it's an interesting thing about this particular artist. Uh, Another aspect, and I said clearly in the essay, and I'll say it again, it's not right or wrong at all. It's a different way of offering work that falls more on the commercial end as opposed to the sacred end where we're working just for ourselves. But John Beard literally will recreate this particular piece of art over and over again, and every time it will be slightly different but that's how he can offer the same thing as an quote unquote original. Now, of course he could take this particular also very dynamic abstract image and he could have it printed on um, all kinds of substrates in all kinds of sizes. And there are actually companies that help an artist to do that and then help them to maximize the sales potential of having this particular image, for example, available in five sizes on various kinds of backgrounds. But <clears throat> it had not been on my own radar that an artist like this could also uh, perfect a particular way of working that would repeat these basic elements endlessly until he discontinues this particular design. And the components would be essentially the same, but there would be some small variations. So that's just an interesting observation. And this is from the perspective of what we're talking about, really cool combination of shapes and lines. And I love the width of the, the, the lines that look like they're almost, um, I'm not sure, ink contrasted with the scribbly pencil lines in the background. So it's very dynamic but definitely done from a different perspective than that might be, then which might be the one that you would approach something where you're thinking you're making a one-off. I couldn't do this over and over again. I'd be bored out of my mind. This is an example of a commercial table that you can purchase on Wayfair. And it's an interesting abstract shape. And also of course, because it's three-dimensional, it takes advantage of form and the surface is a textured surface that has some variation with some um, fairly subtle black marks and uh, an effective piece of sculpture in addition to being functional. 
another painting that can be acquired uh, in a variety of colors. The method of creating it is essentially the same. Um, very uh, thick impasto applications of the acrylic paint, probably using a palette knife. And when we're looking at the um, elements that are included here, we have shape, and maybe we could stretch that and say form to some extent because it is dimensional, but then it also relies pretty much on color in order to add the interest. And another heavily impastoed version of a, an acrylic painting um, where the, the shapes and the marks and the colors are the focus and 90% of what's happening here, the interplay among those elements. Natasha Marie, an artist who does um, have a name and work in, again, th this is available in a variety of sizes, but as a print, which is different from recreating this over and over again, I would think that would make her batty. But in any event, uh, the focus here is on the shape and the size is the contrast. And so it's dynamic because of the implied lines and the implied movement and the implied larger circular shapes that you see made up of the hundreds of smaller circles. And then of course the linear nature of the lines of dots as well. So it's a rather complex piece while really taking advantage of just a couple of the elements and very um, reminiscent of Aboriginal uh, paintings from Australia. Another named artist, in this case, Jackie Allens, and um, this is actually entitled Flower Garden. And I can tell you that, and then you can begin to project that onto the painting, but it's, an effective abstract painting just from the perspective of using the complementary colors effectively and from using very similar shapes. Barclay Butera is an act actually an atelier <clears throat> and under that name of Barclay Butera, there are, it, it appeared to me, to be a, a set of artists <clears throat> who work for that atelier, and one or more of them uh, has perfected this particular approach, which I love, it's effective. So it's just interesting. You could make something like this yourself. And this would be a really interesting uh, piece to adapt to fabric, although this is not a fabric piece, it is an acrylic staining, I think. Um, and we're relying here on the range of monochromatic blue, colors and the shapes to create the interest. I will say I don't find this particularly interesting, but it's a great example of an abstract piece that relies primarily on the texture of the really heavy application of, you could do this with spackling. Uh, in this case, it, it was, it said it's acrylic paint um, could be a combination of the two because, of course, you could tint the spackling in order to get this heavy, again, impasto texture. Uh, and the interest that's in this piece, if there is any for you, is coming from the variety of the two textures, the one on the top right, the one on the left-hand side, and then the variations in the color. Sylvie Demers. Um, I loved this piece too, because I think this would be a really fun inspiration for a fabric piece. And although this is another piece that could be, re she has reproduced it and it's available in several different sizes as a print, uh, it'd be hard to reproduce this and paint it over and over again. Although uh, if this is the way she works, it could be that she's got a whole series that's very similar in style to what this is. I found it interesting because I love the background and the color and the shapes. And if this was a textile piece, I could see those long thin lines being um, actual thread or embroidery or needle felting 
as a way of adding interest to the painted textile or dyed or applique background. So really kind of beautiful piece that could be an inspiration for textiles in several different directions. And, you know, if we go back to the exercise that I suggested in the uh, written tutorial of making one drawing or, or a composition with cut papers and then recreating it in five different mediums or in five different ways or five different colorways, uh, this would be a piece that could really keep you interested for a while, this, this basic, uh, the basic background, the introduction of the colors and also the linear um, components that, that could be added after the fact. So this one really grabbed me. And if I had time, I think I would, I would start exploring in this way. And if you see a particular piece in this presentation or even in the slides that I shared for the creative eye and you like it, you can certainly look at it for a while. This is true of anything you find online as well. You can look at it for a while, but then put it away. Don't try and mimic this exactly. Get the feel for what you like about it and then go at it on your own. I included the background in this particular image so that you'd get a sense of the scale of this piece because it would have a completely different impact if it was nine by 12. So it's quite large. It's easily the size of a very large art quilt. And in this case, it is relying on lines and texture in order to create the interest. And this in contrast to the piece a few slides ago that was just the heavy impasto in three colors, this I could look at for a while. I think it's a really contemplative piece and I really like it very much. And this is another piece that could easily inspire textile work that would be quite effective. I wish there were more hours in the day, don't you? And now a few examples that are textiles. This quilt from Daphne Taylor uh, riffs on the same idea of the piece that we just looked at in terms of the linear quality and the lines that are in the, the horizontal square. And then that beautiful, really lyrical black line that splits the canvas or the quilt right in half. So it's a very, again, a very meditative and contemplative piece. And I think a a beautiful and very subtle example of an art quilt. And then we go the other direction with my good friend Sue Benner's beautiful piece from 2007. I think this was a series based on nests and I believe this is in the collection of the International Quilt Study Center now. And we're relying, Sue really does rely on interesting combinations of shape and we can consider some of what's here as line and there's that underlying geometric uh, set of rectangular boxes in the background. So this is pushing, pushing toward the inclusion of six or seven of the elements of abstraction combined together very, very effectively, um, very lively, very lively. And the last example from embroiderer Shelley Rhodes, I interviewed her earlier in the year. And of course she works every day in some small way on some small stitched and collaged paper meditation as does Liz Kettle. Always good to go back and revisit those because in both cases you'd find um, another really rich place to analyze how the elements of abstraction are being used uh, with textile materials. So in this case, we have a combination of uh, ink and mark making and collage with little paper marks that are similar to the, the drawn marks and then a little bit of stitching on the surface as well in a really delightful interplay of lines and marks and uh, relatively tight color contrast. So this could certainly go on and on and on, and I found it rather addictive. I find looking for elements like this and examples of them pretty darn addictive. And I wanna keep these presentations to the point so that you can get the idea and go out playing and looking and researching on your own. So let this be a starting place and have fun looking for elements individually and collectively 
in the world around you and in any artwork that you're studying in any form.